Hello and welcome to my video on dispersion and negative permittivity materials. I'm going to try and explain what uh, dispersion is. I'm going to give you some examples and um, just briefly you know, mention what a negative permittivity material is uh, if you haven't already seen it, which I'm sure everyone has. Um, so uh, just a quick definition. What is dispersion? Dispersion Dispersion is the frequency dependence dependency of permittivity. I always spell this word wrong. Yeah, I T Y. <laughs> um, permeability. and conductivity. We know that real materials have um, they have these permittivity, uh, permeabilities, and conductivities that that vary with um, vary with frequency. Uh, in the past, you know, we've we've assumed that all these things are just constant for frequency, but now we're looking into um, how uh, permittivity in, in this case, how this changes with with frequency, and I'm sure everyone, you know, this everybody obviously comes across this every day in their daily lives, but you know they may not necessarily uh, know the exact math behind it, which is what I'm going to try and teach here. So, what are some examples of dispersion that we encounter on a daily basis? And there's many examples, um, but I think one of the one of the most simple to grasp, I guess, of the dispersive effects of materials is a prism. Right? And we know we have white light that enters a prism, and we know that it gets bent into this kind of form, right? Where we have, and you know, this is exaggerated a bit. <laughs> it doesn't look exactly like this, but these are just some more splitting of light that I'm drawing in here. And we know that when we shine white light into a prism, uh, we get the rainbow, Roy G. Bibb, out on the other side, right? So everyone has this kind of int intuitive grasp that uh, as frequency increases, as frequency increases, so it is the inde index of refraction. Uh, we know that uh, index of refraction will slow down uh, the beam or sorry, slow down uh, the wave, and that, that's what causes this, um, this angle here as it enters this material. And then when it exits the material, it's going from a higher permittivity out, so it bends uh, away again. So everyone kind of has this, and everyone understands that, you know, uh, red light um, has a lower frequency than violet, so everyone just kind of has this, you know, intuition that, um, that there is this frequency dependency on light. But what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm, I'm going to prove it mathematically. So uh, let's first look at a, a dielectric material. Okay, And in this material we have um, an electromagnetic field that is going to be interacting with um, the electrons in this material. But for now let's just look at uh, one electron that's bound to um, you know, a molecule or some particle uh, in the material. And we have a driving electromagnetic field. Um, and this is E. Right? This can be modeled. So we have this electron that's being you know, wiggled by this electric field. If you imagine, try imagine holding a rope at one end. right? And on this rope, We've got some small mass, and attached to that mass is, um, you know, an elastic force, a, a spring, and we have a damper of some sort at attached to um, attached to this rope. And if you try to wobble this or wiggle this rope up and down, we're going to have to interact with all these uh, components. And this is kind of similar to this electron in this electric field. Um, but in our case, this mass would be, you know, the mass of the electron. 
So this is our electron. And then we have these elastic binding forces. So we'll call these well, the force from this. This is F binding. And we also have a damping force, so an F damping in this uh, material. So let's try to write some equations on how we're going to describe this motion here. So we'll start off with, you know, using Newton's law. Some of forces on this electron has to be equal to zero. So we'll start out by writing the inertia part of the electron, which is related to the second time derivative, plus the damping part is the first time derivative, and then plus the binding force x is equal to our driving force, whatever we're wobbling that with, right? In this case, uh, it's our electric field. So it's a sinusoidal uh, with just some arbitrary phase shift. And from here, we're, we're going to assume now that our x uh, is complex, so it's also, it could be oscillatory, and our, our E is as well. So in the, our E is complex in the spatial domain. Okay, so now we can rewrite this equation as, I'm going to divide both sides by M. That's in every term, so I'll just bring it over. Uh, dx, second derivative of x plus gamma dx over dt plus omega naught or squared x is equal to q over m times the electric field. And I'm going to rewrite this as in its phasor notation. So we know that it's um, varying with time. So I'm also going to say, I'm also going to assume that x is time harmonic as well. So x has some time harmonic component. So I can say that our complex x is equal to x naught, our spatial components times this um, time frequency. And at the same time, if we know that it's time harmonic, we can take this property of, of time harmonics, time harmonic waves. We know that the derivative is equal to negative i times omega, right? So all in this step, I'm going to take the derivative, I'm going to put in e to the minus i omega t, and then I'm going to divide both sides by e to the omega, sorry, e to the negative i omega t, and that will cancel out everywhere. Uh, so I get minus omega squared x naught minus i omega gamma x naught plus omega naught squared x naught is equal to q divided by m times our electric field. And now it's, it's just simple to solve for, oh, this will be a squiggly. Uh, now it's simple to solve for x naught. So our x naught is equal to, let's shift the page, sorry. It's equal to q divided by m all over um, terms on the left side, omega naught squared minus omega squared minus i gamma omega times that field. So this is the equation of motion for that electron, right? But how do we relate this to permittivity? I'm going to show you one of, take, let's take Maxwell's equation. This one for the curl of the magnetic field equal to the derivative of flux density over time. And we know that a flux density, our flux density is equal to epsilon naught times our electric field plus um, this um, dipole moment density, right? And we, we know kind of, you know, in the back of our heads, or at least it should be kind of maybe in there somewhere, that our dipole density is equal to, or this is our dipole moment, is equal to Q times X naught X hat, right? 
And look, now we can bring this into this equation here. And how do we relate this lowercase or our density with our dipole moment density? We know this equation. Capital P is equal to lowercase p times n, where n is the number of molecules per volume. Okay, so now we get, let's, so if we sub everything in, we get this. We get the capital P is equal to n q squared divided by m times, now we have the sum of all these frequency components because each each frequency has its own interaction with or inside the material so we, this is where we have this sum coming up so and then from here uh, we also know that our this is equal to epsilon naught so I'll put these in so it's clear is equal to epsilon naught times beta times e where epsilon naught or sorry just epsilon is equal to epsilon naught uh, one plus right okay and where this is our um, complex uh, relative permittivity. So then now we can write our complex permittivity. Look, this, this looks a lot like this equation here. ER is equal to 1 plus NQ squared divided by M times epsilon naught times all those frequency components I J. I've been writing that backwards. Sorry, this should be a J. If I write J. This should be a J here. Sorry about that. J squared minus omega squared minus I. Yeah, I was getting confused with my eyes. <laughs> I times uh, omega. And this is our equation which demonstrates the frequency dependence of um, on our permittivity. So this will be uh, the complex dispersive dispersive permittivity. Really hard at spelling that word. Hard time <laughs> of a dielectric dielectric. Okay, so what? how does this affect the phase velocity and absorption of a wave, right? Because how are we going to you know, relate this to our index of refraction? How are we going to bend light uh, using these mathematical formulas, I should say? So I'm going to first just let's recall what the, um, the equation for a plane wave is, okay? So we have this expression that we've learned before, kz minus omega t, right? And we know that this our k vector is related to our permittivity in this way. And our permittivity, or sorry, our index of refraction is equal to the square root of our permittivity. And if we plug in what we had on the other page, where did that go? So if we plug in this equation here into this part, is to the power of one half. We have uh, this one plus some term here. Now this is going to be a small contribution, right? Because we have you know, charge here, this is small, and all, all this is quite, quite small. So we can use 
uh, the binomial approximation theorem plus some alpha, right? This is our one half, and this is approximately equal to one plus one half alpha, right? So we can rewrite our index of a fraction. So get rid of this. We can rewrite our index of a fraction to be one plus one half n q squared divided by two m epsilon naught times all the frequency components again. Actually, sorry. Minus m squared minus i. Okay, that was just off memory. I'm gonna see if that was <laughs> okay. No, there's a squared here. Right. Okay. And so this is a complex part. So if we look at the real part, our real index of a fraction is equal to one plus n q squared divided by two. Actually, I think I have too many one halves there. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, that two shouldn't be there. That one half comes from up here. So I got ahead of myself. <laughs> M epsilon naught times the contributions from the frequency components again. F j omega j squared minus omega squared i times the damping factor there. And our imaginary component, the imaginary component is equal to just nq squared times omega divided by 2m epsilon naught times the contribution of the frequency components again. Fj to j omega j squared minus omega squared all squared minus squared j squared and actually there should be on here it should be squared right and this should be j squared no i right that gets removed when we when we square it uh, and omega squared as well so these are the uh, real and imaginary parts of our index of refraction so consider the case where our damping factor consider a case where our damping factor is equal to zero uh, we get a, a real part uh, that simplifies to uh, 1 plus this nq squared divided by 2m epsilon naught times the sum omega j squared minus omega squared. And our omega j is our resonant frequency. And for most materials, uh, it's around uh, uv, right? So if we have the case where the frequency of our light is uh, quite a bit less than uh, UV or less than its resonant frequency, uh, we get, and this is for, you know, visible light um, or lower frequency, we have 1 divided by this term here, right, our 1 divided by omega j squared, that frequency is equal to, uh, let's take out a, our resonant frequency, right? And we get 1 minus omega squared over omega j squared, but we have to minus 1. And again, let's use the binomial approximation. So binomial, binomial, approximation and then we get 1 over a resonant frequency 1 plus omega squared and this should be squared here times omega j squared 
Okay, so now I've proved mathematically that if we look, if we increase our frequency, it's going to equal, or our n is going to increase as our frequency increases. Just from this part, right? So as we increase frequency, this will increase our n. So I've proved here that as we increase frequency, um, our index of refraction increases. We can bend light more as our index of refraction increases. So um, I think at this point, I'm just going to just give a quick, maybe on the back of the page, just an aside, maybe. Um, it's something that we see every day, something that everyone notices. Let's, let's draw the Earth, OK? Why is the sky blue? <laughs> so we, around us, we have uh, this atmosphere everywhere. And say that you're some, someone standing here. And we have white light shining at us from the sun. And it hits our atmosphere. And right away, we're going to have this, these blue or these high frequency components uh, starting to disperse. So out here, we have white light. We still have white light coming through or light coming through. But some of the blue components have started to disperse, right? And we know that if this is just some material material here, if we get white light bouncing off a blue object, right? So we have white light coming in. All the components that aren't the color of the material, that's what gets reflected, right? We know that, that that's what makes a material blue, right? So it's the same way with the sky. All these components are bouncing off um, our atmosphere and hitting our eye. That's why we perceive, you know, the sky as being blue. And again, at, at night, when when we're here, and maybe when the sun is, is setting, sorry, it's setting, we get this white light coming in. We're standing here. We're obviously not that big. We have this white light coming in. It's dispersing, right? So we're getting this dispersion here and this is where the blue light gets dispersed right and then as this keeps as the light keeps traveling through the atmosphere it's, it's traveling through a lot more atmosphere here right so we've got all this compared to just this part so by the time it reaches here but by the time this the, comp the components of the light uh, reach overhead and start to scatter this is where the red start scattering out more. So this is why we see blue light during the day and more of a reddish hue um, towards night because we get this scattering of the of the longer wavelengths as as the um, as the light has to travel through more of our atmosphere. So there's a quick aside. Uh, so now that that's done, let's talk. Okay, sorry about that. My camera died, so <laughs> I had to restart and I've got a, a backup camera here. So now let's look at the case where case of a metal where we have many free unbound electrons. So in this case, I'm going to redraw what we had uh, before, right? Where we've got we've got all these you know electrons and holes floating around in a metal, right? And these are these are very loosely bound or just f completely uh, free electrons, right? And here I've got. So I call this my x direction and my e will be wobbling up and down and I've got this C of electrons the C of electrons and now I'm going to rewrite um, the equation of motion similar to how I did before so I've got my inertia component dt of the electrons plus mass times the damping factor plus now we have a zero where our binding term was right and we lose this binding term this is lost because of our loosely bounded 
of the loose or our free free electrons. So we lose that bound term. And this is equal to this is equal to our driving force still. So cos omega t plus some phase shift. Okay. And from here we're gonna assume the same things. We'll take the same steps. Um, this will be um, we're going to use the property of time harmonic derivatives is equal to i omega. And we'll also say that x is complex and it's time varying. It's time harmonic. And we can come up using similar method as before that my, we can simplify the equation a bit. equal to q times e naught. So this is the same same steps as uh, previous. And now if I solve for x or x naught, I get negative q times e divided by m omega omega plus i times the damping factor. And Again, if we use the same analysis that we did before, and let me find that page. If we use the same analysis where we just plug in our, our x naught, and then we solve for our permittivity, our relative permittivity, we get our er is equal to one minus and q squared divided by omega m epsilon naught um, all divided by omega plus i gamma. And this is known as the plasma frequency. So plasma frequency squared. So we can rewrite this as uh, just 1 minus the plasma frequency squared divided by omega times omega plus i gamma. So in the case, uh, same as before, if our damping factor is 0, uh, we get er relative permittivity is equal to omega p squared over omega squared. Right? And our, this, this is a cool result. Um, if we consider, um, let's consider omega is much less than the plasma frequency. We get our negative, sorry, we get our negative permittivity. And this, this should make sense now. And also, if we choose for the case of metals, right? So we know that metals have the negative permittivity. That's why this should make sense. Now, if we increase that frequency above um, the plasma frequency, we actually get uh, positive permittivity, which is actually kind of cool. <laughs> um, and then just to finish this off, I'll write out the real and imaginary components. So real component of our primitivity. That should be a, a squiggly indicating that it's complex is equal to 1 minus the plasma frequency squared divided by omega squared plus gamma squared and then the imaginary is equal to omega plasma frequency squared divided by omega times our damping factor plus omega squared over damping uh, factor squared. Okay, right. so let's do a quick review of, um, of what we went over.
Okay, page one. So we went over uh, what dispersion is, a quick example of how we see it in everyday life, right? And now, now we've kind of come up with the mathematical proof of, of why this is possible. And to do that, I started with uh, just one electron in an electric field, modeled it as, um, I use this mechanical system just to kind of show you um, how we could model it. Then I took, uh, using Newton's law, we solved for the equation of motion. And then from there, we put it into Maxwell's equations. And from there, we then solved for the complex permittivity of a mat material. And this is called the complex dispersive permittivity of a dielectric. And then from there, this one I wrote on the back. No. From there, we did. We investigated how uh, this affected the index of refraction, or the phase velocity and absorption of a plane wave. And we came up, look down at the bottom, came up with this expression here when we, or when our damping factor is zero, and when we're at frequencies below uh, a resonant frequency of a material, we find that as frequency increases, uh, the index of refraction increases, which, if we go back to that first example, it makes total sense. And then we looked at a metal, in the case of metals where we have many free electrons. We can rewrite that same equation, but without um, the binding term because we have our electrons are very free to move around. And then using the same analysis as before, we simplified and solved for um, our, the motion of, of an electron. And then from there, uh, we used, again, the same procedure that we used on page two. And from there, we found uh, the complex permit relative permittivity. And then in the case of a metal, where if, say we, we set our damping factor equal to zero, and we're looking at frequencies much lower than the plasma frequency, we can see that this comes out with uh, our relative permittivity that's less than zero. And we know that for metals and something interesting when we're above the plasma frequency, um, our permittivity is positive. And then the real and imaginary components of this permittivity. Uh, so thank you very much for um, watching my explanation on this on dispersion and negative permittivity materials. I'm sorry that my camera died halfway through, but I hope this was a good learning experience. Thank you.